I've decided to do a series of videos following on from one another, all on the topic of explaining materialism. I'm going to start off with the topic of classical materialism. What was the materialism of the ancient Greeks and how did it come down to the present day? I'll then be looking at a lot of ideas associated with entropy because ideas of entropy derive in the end from the revival of atomism by Boltzmann and therefore are a revival of classical materialism. And I'll be looking at entropy and work, entropy, computers and information. With luck, I'll do a, a video on Jeremy England's theory of entropy and life. I'll cover entropy and money, or the statistical mechanics of money. And I'll look at how entropy applies to knowledge and the scientific method. Later on, I may go on to look at mechanical materialism, conservation laws, and how that relates to value. So we'll be starting off with classical materialism. Whilst humankind throughout the lands lay miserably crushed, before all eyes beneath a religion, who would show her head along the region skies, glowering on mortals with her hideous face, a Greek it was, who first opposing dared, raise mortal eyes that terror to withstand, whom nor the fame of gods nor lightning stroke, nor thre th threatening thunder of the omna sky abashed, but rather chafed to angry zest his dauntless heart to be the first to rend the crossbars at the gates of nature old. That is part of an epic poem by Titus Lucretius Carus in praise of Epicurus, the Greek he mentions, the Greek who first opposed the gods. If you look, if you read through um, Lucretius' book, De Rerum Natura, which is translated in English as The Order of Things, you see that in the ancient world, materialism was a philosophy that sought both to explain the world and to bring consolation to those who would otherwise be in superstitious dread of the gods or apparently supernatural powers. We don't actually have the books of Epicurus anymore. We've lost them. So much of ancient materialism has to be inferred from Lucretius's book, De Rerum Natura, which is not actually Greek as its title implies, it's a Latin work from a somewhat later period than the original Greek materialist philosophers. But you get a sense of what materialism was about in the following passage. Fear holds dominion over mortality only because, seeing in land and sky so much the cause whereof no wise they know, men think divinities are working there. Meantime, when once we know from nothing still nothing can be created, we shall divine more clearly what we seek, those elements from which alone all things created are, and how accomplished by no tool of gods. So it's explicitly anti-theistic, and it's saying that once you know what natural causes are. You can live in peace without fear. You can accept the world as it is. And that you must seek the natural elements from which things are made. What we would now call the atomic elements. <laughs> 
The basic thesis of Greek atomism was that all that exists are atoms in the void. These atoms are in constant motion. Anything which appears as a static object, static physical object, actually hides continuous motion of atoms behind it. Vortices or swirling motions of atoms which have a temporary stable appearance. And even things which appear to be solid have gaps between the atoms. So that solid objects are only solid because the atoms are relatively stationary, relatively stationary. But there are still gaps. Lucretius gives the example that when you're in a cave with solid walls and solid roof, water still dips, drips through the roof. The atoms of water penetrate through the solid rock. Beyond this, the Atoms are subject to laws of causality and the atoms can be neither created nor destroyed. Nihi ex nihilo. Nothing from nothing comes nothing. But materialism was a dangerous doctrine and it was suppressed. Thomas Nile, the author of a new translation of Lucretius writes, people have been burned alive for reading this book. Copies of it have been destroyed and denounced as heretical, communist, atheist, hedonist and materialist. It is not at all by accident that the writings of Epicurus and Lucretius were destroyed and those of Plato and Aristotle preserved. For all the diversity of the ancient philosophers, only one tradition was courageous enough to deny the existence of God and the immortality of the soul and to reject the politics of the state and the aesthetics of representation. Atomism. Because atomism denied the gods and was fundamentally subversive of religion, once Christianity became the state religion of the Roman Empire, the works of atomism were banned by the church and suppressed. Niall says there have only ever been two real trajectories in Western philosophy, idealism and materialism, Plato versus Democritus, Hegel versus Marx. But materialism revived. It was thought that all copies of the works of Lucretius and Epicurus had been destroyed. Then in 1417, Bracolini discovered a surviving copy of De Rerum Natura in a German monastery and took a copy. By 1600, copies had been printed in all the main languages of Europe. The circulation of this book had a revolutionary effect on the redevelopment of science. There is scarcely a branch of science or of the scientific revolution which took place from the 1500s onwards that cannot be traced to the influence of the work of Lucretius. Its importance was that it gave a coherent and non-theological account of the world. And it gave this account before such an account could be verified by modern science. If you read it, it's amazing the extent to which the world view in Lucretius is compatible with the world as we now understand it. It inspired a whole generation or series of generations of scientists, Bacon, Hobbes, Galileo, Newton, Darwin, Lord Kelvin and Einstein, all studied and were influenced by Lucretius. This is not to say that there has not been an attempted idealist appropriation of classical atomism. The most obvious example is the idea of 
what was called the swerve. Democritus said initially all atoms were moving uniformly in the void. And given such uniform motion, there could be no condensation of atoms into bodies. From this, Democritus deduced that they must occasionally swerve, move off of a, a straight rectilinear course, bump into one another, and thus cause the condensation and vortices that make up the universe we understand. Idealist philosophers then interpret this swerve as a concession to free will. Let's look at the summary of it given by Lucretius. The atoms, as their own weight bears them down, plumb through the void at scarce determined times, in scarce determined places, from their course decline a little, so to speak. Mere change trend, for were it not their want, thus wise to swerve, down they would fall, each one like drops of rain through the unbottomed void, and then collisions ne'er could be, nor blows, among the primal elements, and thus nature would never have created aught. Is it right to see this idea of the swerve as being a sign of free will? No, it's not, and one can understand it better when one sees that modern cosmology has had to resort to something very similar. Nowadays, you'd call it stochastic symmetry breaking. <clears throat> Essentially, the same problem is there when you have to explain the collapse of matter in space in an expanding universe into galaxies. If you have uniform expansion of matter at an initially uniform density, that gives no opportunity for gravitational collapse to occur because the gravitational field sums to zero in all places. <clears throat> now, modern cosmology says that quantum fluctuations in the early universe gave rise to fluctuations in density of matter these fluctuations in density of matter in turn caused non-zero gravitational fields in places and then triggered the collapse initially of hydrogen atoms and helium atoms formed in the primordial Big Bang caused them to collapse and form galaxies. Now if this is true the quantum fluctuations in the initial plasma would be imprinted on the cosmic background radiation and would be detectable as noise with a certain spectrum, angular spectrum, on the background radiation. And when this was actually discovered, the noise pattern in the cosmic background radiation, this verified the idea that thermal fluctuations could trigger the collapse of galaxies. But what are these thermal fluctuations? They are random motions, random variations in density, of the initial particles in the plasma. And these are functionally the same thing as the swerve. They're seen as a necessity to trigger the gravitational collapse and the condensation of matter. But they're also seen as being part of the fundamental theory of motion that we have now, quantum mechanics which has built into it this stochastic element. This stochastic element which is equivalent to the swerve of Democritus.
As the 20th century dawned, you might have thought that 500 years after the discovery of Lucretius's text, atomism would have been firmly established. But no, it wasn't. In fact, the dominant philosophical trend in physics was something called instrumentalism, which was championed by the physicist Mach, who held that science was only concerned with constructing theories about the relationship between observations on measuring instruments, that it should not attempt to postulate real entities which might cause these measuring instruments to have certain correlations. The Marches held that atoms were at best no more than a convenient fiction and that atoms did not really exist. They were just a fiction that people said, well, let's pretend atoms exist and that will account for gas pressure. This was remarkably influential and it was this theory that Lenin wrote his book Materialism and Empirical Criticism to attack, to attack its philosophical basis. Now, the physicists, though, didn't read Lenin. They did, however, read Einstein. Because of the scepticism of physicists who had been influenced by the Machis philosophy, Boltzmann was unable to get his atomic theory of gases, which provides the foundation of statistical mechanics, accepted. And he was eventually driven to, to suicide, despairing of ever persuading his fellow physicists of the atomic theory. In fact, it wasn't until 1905 when Einstein published his paper on the investigations of the theory of Brownian motion that the existence of atoms was really accepted and proven. In that paper, Einstein calculated what amount of motion you would expect of a tiny particle such as a pollen grain floating in water to get from the random collisions by atoms on different sides of it. And he was able to produce a theory of the scale of these motions and the type of random walk that would occur, which I've illustrated from a, a web picture of Brownian motion walk. He was able to calculate accurately the motions that would occur if atoms were real. And from 1905, the real existence of atoms was, was accepted by the physicists. Uh, it says a great deal about the intellectual acuity of Lenin that although he was not a physicist himself, he was able to see the weakness of the Marcus position, even though he himself had not read Einstein's paper. Now, that is as much as I'm going to say about classical materialism and its rebirth culminating in the acceptance of atoms from 1905 by as a result of Einstein's work. The next video I'm going to do will be about labour, purpose and how that relates to entropy and I will be focusing on certain weaknesses certain residual idealisms that people have when they try and conceptualise the labour process.